Welcome to the after lunch nap session. Here to keep you awake is Nikolai from Grid Dynamics. Uh, Nikolai, the floor is yours for the next 30 plus minutes. Uh, he will talk about serverless architecture. Thank you. Hey, thank you for coming. Uh, yes, my name is Nikolai, and today I'm going to talk about how to design data intensive application and serverless architecture. So I'm a senior software engineer at Grid Dynamics. Also, I'm a Node.js expert and a consultant of diagnostics and performance improvement of applications. I work in St. Petersburg and in Russia, and there is an interesting fact that I'm originally from St. Petersburg uh, in Russia, from Russia, but I work in St. Petersburg in Florida. Yeah, so different reality. And um, I already designed uh, a couple of serverless computing platforms with AWS and uh, uh, Grid Dynamics partners or clients are Amazon, Google, uh, or Microsoft, uh, Apple, uh, such or big companies of retailers like uh, Macy's, American Eagle, and so on. And yo, know, let's focus on the serverless designing. So serverless computing has become very popular, and uh, those solutions are really uh, cheaper. And based on my experience, it's 70% cheaper than uh, not serverless solution. But each year, AWS announces very awesome, very beautiful services, uh, serverless services. But there is a lack of patterns, best practices, and uh, um, solutions of experience, or especially if you are not an AWS developer. And um, today, I'm going to show you how properly to design the data intensive application to do not lose the money. So, data intensive application, it's a uh, kind of applications that work a lot with data. So we may have structured data, unstructured data, and we need to extract this data, transform and load to the different data storage or warehouse. After that, we have to analyze this data because we have to show to business something interesting, right? And uh, so today I'm going to talk about this. So we'll focus on the step number uh, one and step number two. Also, we will focus about uh, ETL pipeline uh, analysis and the scalability of the data. So let's go forward. But the first question is, where does the data come from? So it might come from IoT devices, billions of IoT devices all over the world. And we have such a pro uh, project at Grid Dynamics. So this data is processed in real time and stored it to the database. Or it can come from different enterprise platforms, data centers, API services and uh, to data lake. And after that, it's processed in a pipeline to the database, and it might be in batch or stream processing. But you can use existing processing uh, services like GlueJob from AWS, it's ETL pipeline, or you can use Kinesis plus Kinesis Analytics, Athena, awesome services to do stream processing. But if the logic is not so easy, it's not simple, and it's uh, quite complicated. You can use AWS Lambda and build your own pipeline. And I have a very interesting experience. We had a project, and we had to develop the platform for 300 plus customers. And each customer uh, established his own data processing rules. Moreover, he could uh, update them or add new rules and it was on the fly. So we had to process data, and also we had to reprocess data, but he's ad hoc request. So, so many, many data manipulations that we had to do. And develop a such platform, uh, we use AWS Lambda. But during the development, this uh, uh, um, project reminded me of some uh, famous picture from uh, some movie. Yep. And we did it using AWS Lambda. So AWS Lambda, it's a compute service. So you basically, you write your own code, and this code will be automatically invoked in the container. So you don't need to worry and manage your infrastructure. And it's triggered by event. It's highly scalable. That's why I like it. And it's stateless, and it's very cheap. That's why business loves it. And with AWS Lambda, you, you can process even a data lake. And data lake concept is pretty small. So data comes from different services, enterprise platform, and is uh, stored and collected in uh, buckets. So 
Uh, there is an example, each bucket, it's a data center. And inside the each bucket, uh, there are some folders, like a partitions for the type of data. So to process this data, what we need to do, so we use a folder, like a bucket, and there is a snapshot for, let's say, one day, right? So we need a Lambda function that will scan the whole bucket file folders for your files. After that, it will combine a message with the pass or files. We need an another more Lambda to read uh, those files, merge records, to produce a model, right? And after that, we need to process, analyze this model to collect to the database. So to make a very simple, minimalistic pipeline to process a data lake, we need at least three Lambda functions. But after, we need to have uh, services uh, to transport the data. And uh, Step by step, we'll process, scan, and process those data until we process the whole snapshot from Data Lake, and we've done this job. So let's focus on the transport because it's very, very um, uh, significant to and valuable. So there is a, a notification topic service. It's a fan out. So let me um, explain how it works. I have a Candice. So SNS topic, it's like, it's a publish subscribe. So do you like Candice, guys? It's Candice from Russia. So it works like this, okay. Hey, guys, catch it. <laughs> who like, uh, who, who, who want Candice? Awesome. <laughs> so it's SNS topic. It doesn't worry about delivery, right? It's good, but not so, not so protected. Hey, okay. So, but I also can put the Candice hero like, hey guys, enjoy, take the candies, and it will be like a queue. So you, everyone can come and come here to take a candies. So it's faster and it's uh, like reliable because candies are here, right? And it's out of scale. But I can hire some people that will go through the ranks and will deliver you a candies. It's like stream works. It must, must faster and I can deliver up to 10,000 records, right, with one people. But I have to pay them each hour. It's expensive and it's not fully serverless and, uh, um, yeah, and uh, you can, it's not, doesn't have auto scaling. But there is a DynamoDB streams that has auto scaling. And the same uh, performance, very, very fast, exactly once processing, I like it. But you will know about any change of, uh, candy fade, so you will know about the candy was eaten, uh, or the candy uh, updated, or you have, I have more candy, so pick up, so. But if you need to choose about transport, be f uh, ready to pay, because for example, if you compare Q and DynamoDB streams that are uh, similar, because it has auto scaling, but DynamoDB streams really faster, you have to pay 10 times more money. Be ready for that. Okay, to process the data, we can use Q for ETL batch processing. It's enough, and that is how it looks like. We need uh, three queues and one notification topic to unknown the pipeline. And uh, hey, we have a message. We need to process the data. This is a snapshot date. Okay, but if you need to go to the real-time processing, because you have to ask your business how soon you need to present data or analyze the data and there is delay is pretty small, or your delay uh, some uh, decrease uh, during the process development time, you can go to the streaming processing and real time. You need to use data stream, Kinesis data stream, and it's pretty simple to replace Q to the stream. And you don't need, so you need to give up with the first part and continue to develop the second part. That's how it works. Yeah. So, to extract the data, you need to move from the big data, from the data lake or a lot of messages from IoT devices to the large number of messages. Use queues for messages and data streams for big models or especially for big collections because in a stream you can pass them as a train of data. Yep. Uh, do not rush to use streams. It's expensive and um, yeah, so you have to choose the transport uh, for your needs. Okay, it was about uh, extraction. Let's focus on how to transform the data. Uh, yep, so there is our pipeline, minimalistic pipeline, and there is a 
uh, part of application or of architecture where we transform the data. So let's focus on it. Um, there is one my uh, suggestion: do not do everything. So do not put every uh, the whole logic of your transformation to the one lambda function. So use um, event-driven uh, design patterns names, for example. You can uh, make merger, you can add a filter, you can make a uh, finout copy or use like some services, SNS or Kinesis to, uh, for that purpose. Writer, splitter, so make your pipeline. But if you do that, focus on models, on your contracts, because, for example, we, uh, and it was in my practice, uh, merger. We merged a lot of data and made a structured uh, model, and it was uh, like context one. But some, uh, after some time, uh, people from uh, other department came to me and he asked, "Hey, buddy, I like your data. I need your data. There is my pipe. Boom, boom. Pass data here, and we had to transform uh, transform the models to be ready to send it. So." Don't blur your model through the pipeline. Keep the three contracts interfaces. Uh, it's like from domain-driven design. Or example, you pass your data to the Kinesis Data Analytics, and someone can come to you and ask you, hey, I like your stream and data. I have my own ETL pipeline. I will subscribe to your stream and pass data here. So it's another context. So don't blur your models over the pipeline. Hey. Okay, we, uh, we separate our transformation, our transform lambda to three lambda functions, transform one, two, and three. And uh, there might be a case when each lambda function has to connect to SQL database to make a query. For example, the first one has to select the uh, data, the second one has to insert the data, and the third one had to update the data. So in the result, the many lambda function has to query database. It's not good. A lot of connections, and connections is a part of uh, these architecture limitations. And um, a lot of dependencies, because each lambda, functions, uh, lambda function has to have packages for how to, how to connect to RDS, Aurora, SQL database. So it's not good. What to do? We need more lambda. Yep. It's funny, but it works. So. We need to hide the uh, data access logic behind the API lambda. And in this case, all queries uh, logic will be hidden and you will have less connection. So you can keep connection pool in one lambda function. So you will reduce connection and it allow you increase your scalability. Moreover, you will have more or less dependencies. That is nice too. Uh, very, very interesting moment is reliability in this uh, architecture. Because uh, when your message is not processed and it's failed, it uh, is not gone. Yep. It returns back to the service like queue or Kinesis. Uh, and uh, those services try to retry your message because to do not lose the message. And message, each message, it's a money. I had a very interesting uh, uh, example in, from my real life. Uh, so let's imagine that factory produce sport cars, expensive sport car, and we lose a message of how many logo in front of car we need to, uh, the demand of the logo we need to make, and we lose those messages, and without those logos, we, I cannot say the car is ready, I cannot, this car can be, sold, uh, can be sold, right? It's a business problem, we lose money. So every message is money and it's very important. But how to protect uh, from message loss? We need to set up a uh, retry strategy. To do that, we can use a pattern a dead letter queue. And every time when your function like transform cannot uh, process the message, it returns the error, service like a queue or a stream try to retry this message. And if not, it will pass it to dead letter queue. And after that, me or you as a developer, you come, you make a fix, you, you'll take a look uh, on the message, on the errors, you make a fix, deploy. After that, you pass a notification, okay, reprocess those types of errors because I made a fix, I'm ready to process them. So pass a message to the reprocess lambda function and this lambda function will extract 
those messages that are ready to, re to, to be reproducible. So, and pass to the topic. And so this is a controlled loop. So you don't lose your money, your messages. You can retry, reprocess. And you don't need to reprocess gigabytes of data or terabytes of data. You just can reprocess some messages. So it's, it's very helpful. The many, uh, the much uh, interesting moment with the uh, Kinesis, with the streams, because Kinesis streams are really care about uh, persistent and those message will uh, will be retrieval uh, each 100 millisecond up to seven days. So it's not so expensive, but it spams your channel because it will retry, 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 retry. It's not good. So, and we have to split our messages by the type. The first type is infrastructure errors because you can, um, those errors can be, uh, can be uh, you can process those errors, uh, right, without your help because this might be a timeout issue and so on. So after some time, like um, uh, one second, it can be, you can process uh, those messages. But if the message is a business logic error, internal error and so on, and you have to help your application, you have to make a fix to process this data. Yeah, we need to pass this data to a dead letter queue, but we have to lie to Kinesis and say, okay, I'm good, so nothing happened, I'm okay, yep, success. And we pass data hiddenly, and after that, we again uh, pass a message through the topic, reprocess those messages, uh, pull from dead letter queue and pass back to Kinesis. So it's a controlled loop of processing and uh, yeah, it helps a lot and uh, you don't need to uh, reprocess a lot of data, gigabytes or even terabytes. So that's how it looks like. Our pipeline and um, uh, the controlled loop of uh, reprocessing. So it's easy to troubleshoot, right? Because uh, when you work with microservices uh, like containers, you lose your data, you need to research from logs, here you keep all messages, failed messages, in a persistent storage, like a queue. So you can come every time, uh, just take a look, research, understand how you need to fix this data. And you can easily reproduce uh, right, the error locally because you have a data. And yes, you don't need to reproduce a lot of data. Okay, so how to transform the data? One lambda function, one responsibility. It's very important. Divide the pipeline into boundary context, so don't blur the transformation of logic of your model through the whole pipeline. Encapsulate the database query behind the API function to reduce uh, the number of connections and queries. And use data queue to protect your data for reliability. Okay, let's focus on data loading. So we need to load data to the, some storage data warehouse. And that is, that is very uh, where this part of logic is located on the architecture. So let's focus on it. So our Lambda function can receive one uh, up to 10,000 messages if we use Kinesis streams. But if we process the data and uh, writes, uh, and it, this Lambda writes to database the data, it has two points of failure. So, because issue may happen on processing or during writing, it's not good. And usually we have to write to the different databases, different storages. For example, we need to write data to the UI dashboard to visualize it, right, for the charts, diagrams, and so on. We need to put data for accounting or we need to col uh, collect, uh, put data to, again, to the data lake in a structured view. And here we have more points of failure, it is not good. So what to do in this case? Retry the whole batch, but you need to retry up to 10,000 records in the message, not, not good. Or retry manually failed records in a Lambda. So let's, uh, let's focus on it. If we retry the whole batch, we need to roll back those messages or records that were already written in a database to do not have uh, duplications uh, next time when we do retry. Or if we want just to retry like accounting writing, we need to orchestrate this logic in Lambda function, but this is not a good approach, not a good solution, and it will not help in all cases. How to do that? Decouple your writers. So make a new Lambda function for each writer, for each database. Uh, and in this case, you will have a, a 
an error in of infrastructure, like your database is busy, yeah, it cannot, uh, you cannot access the database and write something right now, you don't need to reprocess the data one more time. So it's cheaper, and if there are errors uh, during the processing, you don't need to write to database again. So you divide the responsibility, it's awesome. Moreover, so you have independent retries, and moreover, better scalability. You can set up like 1,000 instances for processor, writer, or processor lambda function, and less for each writer. It helps. Okay, but what if we need to support distributed transaction? What if we need to roll back in case of error from other database? And for this case, uh, I suggest you to use step functions. Yeah, it's a very good approach. So it's a mechanism uh, that has uh, instructions. So you can set up and describe your uh, step like first writer, second writer, third writer. And in case of any errors, you can easily roll back all uh, operations. Yeah. But you also can use DynamoDB streams. And this is where it's very helpful. Um, so if your DynamoDB is a main database, so you can subscribe to the stream on each change of record in DynamoDB, the virus event, like insert, modify, update, and you may have up to two subscribers that will react to those changes and write records to the data lake or to the like SQL database of RoroDB. Yep, let's use it. But usually we don't write to one database. We write to several database uh, like SQL, NoSQL, um, data lake, and if we will focus only on transformation to make our pipeline faster, we can lose the focus on who will access to the data, the consumers. And in my experience, it was a situation when we developed a really, really fast platform on the Kinesis stream. It was very, very fast. But after some time, uh, we created a new application developed uh, for risk, uh, forecast, anti-fraud, machine learning. So your pipeline, it's just a core of the many, many platforms. So you need to focus how you will extract this data, uh, which patterns, query. And we had completely redo our pipeline because we had to make uh, for risk and anti-fraud a lot of joins. So we had to use graph database and we moved to Neptune GraphDB. So don't forget uh, um, about your consumers and who will access uh, to your data and how. Okay, so decouple uh, functions by points of failure. It's easy. Uh, use infrastructure as a code. So basically don't orchestrate uh, inside your Lambda. Use the step functions and DynamoDB streams for transactions and uh, your pipeline is just a core. So think about future platforms around it and how they will access to the data. So we extracted, extracted the data, transformed it, loaded it, and now we need to be sure is the job is done, right? Because we need to make a decision and, and go forward. So how to understand? But there is a problem. Uh, if we process the data, we write in parallel. So it's not easy to, for each time the function to make a decision, is it done or not? Because it might be thousands of them. Or, okay, it's, it's okay if you process in a, in a batch, right? Because we can monitor, um, like, new, using new relic, right? And monitor the window uh, between the processing and to be sure, okay, it's done. But what if, what if you do streaming processing? Because data comes constantly. You need to separate and understand it's done or not. You need to notify the uh, user, for example, or visualize the data. So, and it's again, it's right, it's right in parallel. To do that, in the start of our pipeline, we need to use DynamoDB table to make a log for, that, uh, for the job, like job was created. And every time when we get the record from the uh, data lake or your database, we put the log message to the pro uh, processed record table uh, with the st uh, state done or not done. And every time when we write, when we analyze, and after that we write this record to the database, we change our state to done. So until we process all data, and we have a stream, DynamoDB stream, that fire a Lambda function that checks the count of already processed records. 
And if the count is equals to number of all records, that it means the job is done. So that's how we do that. And in the end, it notifies through another stream, uh, stream a subscriber. It, it notifies uh, the user or the other system about completion of the job. Uh, let's focus on data analysis. Uh, this is second two uh, step. Uh, step number two. So in data analysis, it's actually another pipeline with another logic, and actually this logic is much uh, complicated. Uh, it's not simple because you have to analyze risk, right? Accounting and so on. And um, but the first part of the job that I just described, you can, if it's simple, you can change it, uh, replace it by glue job ETL, uh, ETL service from AWS, and you can write your transformation on SQL. Uh, and, and to go to the second step from the main architecture, and actually the step number three here, you use step functions, so you already know about it. But uh, also to make a decision the job is done, we need to use DynamoDB stream. So to build uh, an analytics uh, uh, plat uh, platform, data analysis, uh, ETL, pipeline, we can use, uh, again, uh, Lambda functions. So let's focus, uh, yeah, so, sorry. So you build your own pipeline based on logic that you need to, to do. And that's how you orchestrate multiple ETL jobs uh, with uh, step functions. Uh, okay, let's focus on scalability. It's very important because if you uh, architect uh, and you make a, a big, big, big pipeline and in the, in the end it's not scalable, that's not good because you need to focus on scalability. And that's how it looks like. So simple pipeline, right? Three Lambda functions, some queues. So basically you can uh, choose how many Lambda functions you need to run in parallel uh, for each step of your pipeline. So let's uh, say that we need just only 10 lambda functions to start uh, to make for the job, okay. Uh, 100 for files, to read files, and uh, 1000 to process messages, because messages are a lot, it's usually it's uh, millions, millions of records. So it's easy, but the most interesting part that uh, lambda scales very, very high, it's awesome, but Database and services not not so uh, flexible in this case. So you need to focus on on your transport and uh, database. So this is uh, uh, an example of uh, minimalistic presentation of uh, architecture diagram from some project. So actually, it's a blueprint. So and using the, uh, this blueprint, we uh, were able to process. Uh, 10 and up to 100 gigabyte per second on 5,000 up to 10,000 functions in parallel. Yeah, it was so fast, but we had to focus on our database, so DynamoDB capacity, we had to focus on Aurora connections, uh, database size, we had to switch to the Neptune, it's here, it's a graph database, so you, you need to focus on the data, and this architecture uh, so you need to build architecture, focus on the data, on the data uh, view uh, and the schema. So that's how it looks like. So uh, in the end, design mistakes, it's a solution price, right? Uh, but in serverless, you can build very, very flexible architecture. You can switch from a batch processing, on a f uh, even on the fly, to the stream processing, right? switch your transport and just reduce some architecture patterns. And uh, you can run thousand uh, lambdas in parallel, that's really high scalable, and process gigabytes of data per second. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Nikolai Matvienko. I'm from Green uh, It's an international company, and we ha now we have an office in Belgrade, so welcome. And uh, thank you so much. Okay, I understand that not all of you are uh, designing uh, serverless archi architecture and even work with serverless, but if you have some questions, uh, you can ask me, or if you'd like a Candice.
Hi. So my question is on the first step of your uh, sort of ETL part, uh -huh. where you actually ingest something from external API. Uh, is uh, are the lambdas best solution for that? Because you can experience some throttling from that third party UI. And if not, what what is what would be? Oh, you ask about the lambda extracts the data from the uh, some storage, right? Yeah, from from some external API. Let's say service. Uh, n uh, external. No, no, no. Lambda doesn't uh, extracts data from a s external API. It extracts usually data from a data lake. Right, but in your presentation there were cogs with uh, API written in the center. So who extracts data from those APIs? Oh, I got it. So there is another Lambda function, which uh, I call API, right? Uh, yes, so you need to invoke, uh, so actually you invoke the Lambda function inside your Lambda. Yeah, so first time you will have a delay, but you need to set up the concurrency of those Lambdas to run next time uh, on the worm start. But uh, if you focus, well, let's say you need to open the connection to uh, MySQL, right? Uh, you need to spend the time. And uh, to run a Lambda function, even like uh, on Node.js, it's, uh, it's faster. And when it's uh, already run it before, so it's a warm start, it's, it's pretty fast. So you, like, you need to choose um, like scalability, like connection count, uh, and you need to compare the performance. And in our case, it worked, f it, uh, worked faster. OK, thanks. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Are there any limitations uh, regarding the time mm -hmm. the Lambda functions can run? And if there are, uh, how could that be a problem for the machine learning applications, which typically can take some time to execute? And what would be solution for that? Thank you. Uh, very, very good question about the time. So it's a long topic. Because sometimes, like when you see the time is 15 minutes, it might be a problem in your Lambda function because you do not return, like, uh, if it's a JavaScript, like a, a promise resolve and so on, so you need to check the errors. But yeah, there is a limitation, 15 minutes. And actually, every year, AWS uh, increase the uh, uh, limitation. So in the past, it was five minutes. Now it's 15 minutes. So actually, you can run a, a job. But in my experience, I do not recommend to run a function uh, for 10 minutes, even for 10 minutes. It should be, it should be less. So because um, if you run well, lambda functions that do a lot, does that does a lot uh, in 15 minutes, and you run like thousands of lambda function in parallel, you pay the same uh, the same money because you paid for the time. Uh, about the machine learning, um, mm, repeat your question about the time about machine learning. Uh, are they suitable for machine learning tasks since there is that limitation? But if it can be run in parallel, highly parallel, then, may, then might be. Right? Yes, uh, yes, I understand. It's typically, long-running task with large amounts of data. Yeah, I understand. So these Lambda functions, we prepare data for machine learning. But for machine learning, we run existing services of, of AWS. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>